you this morning. We are again in Galatians, and we're going to be looking at the third chapter of Galatians today. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter chapter 3, verses 15 to 29. So we're going to start at chapter, verse 15, and we're going to go to the end of the chapter. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to, to his seed. The scripture does not say to his seeds, meaning many people, but it says and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it will no longer depends on a promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred to had come. The law was put into effect through through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. Father God, there's a lot in that package that, that, that we just read. Uh, help us, Lord, as we look into that. Help us to understand that. Help us to see that it is by grace and grace alone that you have reached out to us. Uh, we pray that my words and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So that was kind of a, a heavy passage, kind of, kind of deep in places. So we're going to pull that apart. We're going to try to figure out what Paul was saying to us. We're looking at, at that next section of Galatians as we study this in our series this week, uh, the book of, of Galatians. Uh, we're going to see that even in our failures, um, such as our inability to follow God's law or our inability to please Him by ourselves, um, that, that there is still meaning. Even in our failings and our strugglings, in our yearnings, it's all part of God's plan. God foresaw it all. He saw our struggles. He saw our, our weaknesses, our sinfulness. And even more, he saw our triumphs. And, and he worked all of those into his plan. Uh, and, and he promises to be with us to the very end. Now, we ended up last week in chapter 2. In the first half of chapter 3, that we kind of skipped over a little bit, Paul continues to make that argument that we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And he makes a point worth repeating here. He, he asks in verse 2, and, and again, this is before we started reading today, but, but he asks, did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Was it by what you did, obeying the law, or was it by faith in believing what you heard? Truth is, no one's ever received the Holy Spirit by, by earning 
But you can't follow the law and be good enough to receive God's grace. You don't receive the Holy Spirit by, by doing something. We receive the Holy Spirit when we believe. We receive the Holy Spirit by faith. Now, now sometimes maybe somebody laid hands on us and we may have received the Holy Spirit. Maybe it was through prayer. Maybe it was just you and God. Maybe it was a part of the baptism when you come up out of the water. You feel the Holy Spirit coming through. But in every case, it's an act of faith. It's not something that we do. We may put us in a place where, where God can reach us. Um, put ourselves in a place where God can reach us. But we can't earn the Holy Spirit. It is always a gift of faith. Never through an act of the law or an act of doing something to try to earn it. Now, if you remember, Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians because some Pharisee believers had, had come in and, and they started to, to, to tell the people that, that Paul's gospel message isn't complete, that he's missing one thing. And the thing that, that he was missing, uh, they were saying that you still have to follow the law. That Paul's right, everything Paul says about grace and faith is good stuff, but you still have to follow the law. And, and that's why Paul wrote this book. And that's why immediately in chapter 1 of Galatians, Paul laid out the gospel message, the good news for us, that Jesus died for our sins. Uh, in chapter 2, Paul explained that we're not saved by, by the law. We're saved by faith in Jesus. And we kept hearing over and over last week, and I think we'll keep hearing it today, over and over, because it's something we've got to know, we've got to understand that we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And that's kind of the message of, of chapter 2. Jesus took on the curse of the law so that we would be free. Um, Paul then tells uh, how his message isn't a new message. They may have thought this was something new, but it wasn't new at all. In fact, it predated the law by thousands of years. Uh, this goes all the way back into Genesis, into the middle of Genesis, or even the first portion of Genesis. Grace by faith has always been God's plan. And so to explain that, he talks about the promise. And that's uh, where we're going to pick up here. We're going to look into that promise uh, the first point we want to talk about this morning is, is that we are heirs of a promise. The Jews received a promise, uh, a covenant, which is really an unbreakable promise. Uh, and the promise came down through Abraham. In Genesis 17, verse 19, God tells Abraham, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for all his descendants after him. So the promise is going to be through Abraham's descendants, through Isaac's descendants, um, down the line from there. Backing up a few chapters before that, because that's not the first time God gives Abraham this promise. Uh, we see it in Genesis 13, verse 15. God tells Abraham, all the land you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. Now, I think we probably know that the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And in that word that's translated offspring is singular. Now, in English, offspring could be singular or plural, right? Paul talks about the seed being singular. And that word translated offspring is, is singular in the NIV. Um, in fact, if you go back to the NIV and you look at that, Genesis 13, 15, there's a little footnote that says, or seed. And, and Paul's referring to that being translated as seed. Uh, but, but it is singular. And Paul makes the point that the promise came down through Abraham, through Isaac, through David, King David, to Jesus. And that Jesus is the seed that that promise refers to. He is the offspring, singular offspring, the seed that God is referring to. So Paul continues in verse 17, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. God's promise to Abraham is still in effect. Uh, 
He says 430 years later, the, the Hebrew people were in slavery for 430 years. This is actually quite a bit more than 430 years later. But, but what he's saying is after the, the time in Egypt in slavery, the covenant is still in effect. The promise is still in effect. Uh, I'm not sure the Jewish people of Jesus' day believed that. They believed in the law. They believed if you want to be right with God, you have to follow the law. And, and they never thought of that promise from Abraham as, as necessarily applying to them. They just thought to be right with God, we have to follow the law. But remember we saw last week in Galatians 2 verse 16 that, that by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So the law isn't enough to save us. It's not enough to justify us. Why not? Because really, none of us are good enough to keep it to the letter. We all fall short, right? Next, Paul walks us through why, why the law was given. If, if it wasn't to save us, if it wasn't to provide righteousness for us, then, then why is it here? Why do we have the law? Verse 19, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promises referred had come. So it was given to the Israelite people until Jesus came. Once Jesus came, the law is no longer required. Remember when the law was given? The law was given during the Exodus, right? The Hebrew people had been slaves for 400 years. So re read that as they were slaves all their lives. They were born in slavery. All the people that Moses led out of Egypt were born in slavery. Think about with this with me. God had sent Moses to bring the people out. Remember the plagues? Pharaoh finally gives in. The people leave. Pharaoh has a change of heart. He sends his soldiers out after them. Uh, there's a confrontation at the Red Sea where God parts the sea. All of the Hebrew people are able to make it through on dry ground. As the Egyptians followed through to try to get them, try to capture them, bring them back, uh, the, the waters of the Red Sea came in again. All of the Egyptian army is destroyed and the Hebrew people were free. But these people, the Hebrew people as a nation had been in slavery for 430 years. The people that, that Moses let out had always been slaves. They didn't know how to live as free people. So, so God gave them their freedom, but they didn't know how to live as free. You catch a parallel from week one? The reason why Paul wrote this letter was because people had been freed from the law, but they didn't know how to live as free people. The Hebrew people had been slaves for 400 years. They were set free, but they didn't know how to live as free people. There's a parallel there, isn't there? In the first case, with the Egyptian people, the, the uh, Hebrew people, God gives them the law as, as a guide. You don't know how to live as free people? This is what you do. Follow this law. God gave Moses this law for the people to follow as a guide. Because remember, they're in God's presence, right? God was with them. He was the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of, the, the, the pillar of uh, smoke by day. He was with them all the time. And they didn't know how to live in the presence of a holy God. So God gave them the law. As a guide, this is what you do. You do this, you do this, you do this. Uh, at the time, the law was needed because they had no idea how to live uh, in the presence of God. In fact, by giving them the law, God was actually showing them a glimpse of his heart. God wants to be in a relationship with his people. He wants to be physically present with his people. He wants to have that relationship. He wants us to love him. Uh, he loves us. Uh, he wants that meaningful and loving relationship with his creation. Uh, and, and I think that's what the, the law tells us, that, that he gave the law so that they would know how to behave in, uh, in a relationship with God. But the law also reveals that we can't do that on our own, can we? We can't keep the law on our own. No one can follow all the provisions of the law. 
No one is good enough. No one can measure up, right? So that brings us to the next point, I guess. The, the next thing we're going to look at this morning. That we are all prisoners to the law. The Jewish people were literally prisoners to the law. They couldn't escape the law. They were bound by the law. And, and every time they mess up, they just had to press on and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. Keep offering uh, sacrifices of atonement. Keep offering sacrifices of atonement. They kept falling short, uh, but they had to keep going and keep going. Uh, almost to the point of futility. In, in verse 23, Paul wrote, Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. They were prisoners to the law. Verse 24, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So Moses received the law as, as a guide for the people who didn't know how to live free. The law was their guardian, showing them what they should be doing. Romans 10 verse 4 puts it this way, Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for, for everyone who believes. Verse 25, now that this faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. We begin to see that the law was a stopgap measure. The law was there from the time of the Exodus until the time of Christ. Just to kind of see the people through that time. Uh, you don't know how to live as free people? This is what you do. When Christ came, we don't need the law anymore because now we have Christ. Now we follow Christ. And Christ shows us how we should, how we should go. Uh, Romans 7 verse 4, Paul wrote, So my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. When we come to faith in Christ, we no longer need the law. We no longer need anything. Because salvation isn't through what we do. It's through faith alone in Christ alone. You know, we've been talking about the law a lot this morning. And I can just imagine that some of you are probably thinking, yeah, the pastor, we're not under the law. We, we've never been under the law. Why all this concentration on, on what Paul has to say about the law? Um, I think there's two reasons why we need to be familiar with it. And the first is, is as a reminder for us to check our motives. To make sure we do what we do for the right reasons. We talked, I don't know if it was last week or the first week, um, how every one of us has this list of things that we do to, uh, to, to maybe to try to please God or whatever. We, we read our Bibles, we do our devotions, we, we come to the Bible study, we come to church, we, we do all these things, right? Sometimes there's a danger that, that we do what we do to earn our way. We do what we do so we stand out to God, so that God notices us, so that we're good enough to do something. But that's the wrong motivation because we can't be good enough. We can't do the right things enough. Uh, the fact is, Jesus gave His Son as a sacrifice for us because He loves us. And it's when we love Him and we put our faith and our trust in Him uh, and, and we do these things, the Bible study, the church attendance, the, Bible, the, the devotions, all of that. We do all of that because we want to spend time with Jesus. That's the right motivation. So all this talk about the law is a reminder for us to check our own motivations and make sure we're doing what we're doing for the right reason. I mean, those are all good things. Those are all things that, that, that God can, can use to grow us closer to Him. Uh, but if we're doing it because we think we'll somehow earn better standing with God, that's not going to work. We do those things because we want to be with God. Because we, we love Him. And our motivation is just out of, out of the grace that God has given us. We do those things. Uh, we want to make sure those things don't, don't kind of uh, interfere with our faith in Christ. So check your motives. Uh, love for Christ first. Then we can do things that put us in a place to, to please God and, and to receive God's grace. But the second reason we need to be familiar with all of this talk about the law is, is that we need to realize that, that the law wasn't given to provide salvation. 
And we need to realize it to the extent that nothing we can do, uh, we can't follow the law, but there's really nothing else that we can do either that's going to earn us salvation. And we need to know this because sometime when we're out sharing our faith, we're going to come across somebody that says, I, I don't really need that religion stuff because I'm okay. I'm, I'm good enough. I've never really done anything that bad. And, and I'll be okay. I, I'm okay with God. But, but we need to know that, that He's not okay with God. Because there's nothing we can do on our own that makes us okay with God. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how many things you've done that might uh, be pleasing to God. We, we can't be good enough to please God. Max Licato, and I can't remember the name of this book, but he used the illustration. He used an illustration there uh, to get us thinking about this maybe in, in a little bit better way. And, and I just kind of chuckled when I read it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it. But, but he says, imagine... If, if we think we have to be good and we have to be so good that, that none of us could ever reach it, imagine that the requirement is sort of like jumping from here to the moon, right? Um, I don't know some of you. I mean, Randy and Shane are both in pretty good shape. Maybe they could could get close. I don't know. But, um, but I'm going to wager that none of us can jump high enough to touch the moon, right? Uh, no matter how high we jump, we're, we're going to fall woefully short. I mean, some people, maybe normal, maybe Leona might only make it a few inches. Uh, maybe some of us, Mike and, and Randy, might make it a few feet. But none of us are, are going to get even close to high enough to touch the moon, right? We're all going to fall woefully short of that goal. Just like when we try to earn our salvation ourselves by being good enough, by not doing those things wrong, um, we're all going to fall woefully short. Um, that far short. Only Jesus was perfect. Only Jesus uh, could help us achieve that, that goal. That's why Christ came. But in reality, no one could keep the law. No one could earn their way so they were always convicted by their shortcomings. They were always making sacrifices to atone for their sin. They were always falling short, keeping the law. They weren't good enough. So God made one sacrifice, His Son Jesus Christ, one for all. That person you come across that might think he's okay with God, he isn't. Um, but that's okay. I, I'm not good enough either. So Christ died for me. You're not good enough, so Christ died for you. And that person you meet that thinks he's good enough, Christ died for him too. Which brings us to our, our final point this morning, number three, uh, clothed in Christ. We can be clothed in Christ. We were heirs to a promise, held prisoners uh, by the law, but now we can be clothed in Christ. Verse 26 says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ alone. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So by accepting Jesus as our Lord, it's, it's almost like he can pick us up under his arm and jump to the moon. It's like he can do it for us. Something that was totally out of the question for us to accomplish. He can just pick us up and do it. Uh, he can jump plenty high enough. When we die to our old self, we live as new creations in Christ, being clothed in Christ. That's really, Richard didn't hear this morning, but, but Tuesday night he shared that that's the image of baptism, isn't it? That when we, when we get down under the water, uh, it's, it's symbolic of, of the death of our old self. And we come up out of the water, it's symbolic of our new lives in Christ. We're born again, not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. Verse 28, Paul goes on, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. It speaks to the unity of the body of Christ. We are one with true believers all over the globe. People who believe uh, that, that our salvation is possible through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, we are united with them. That's, that's why we can reach out to our Methodist neighbors and, and do the Good News Club. 
It's why we could even include some Catholic friends in our VBS, because we are one with them. Uh, they are our brothers and sisters. That's what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 10 when he said, I have sheep that are in other pens that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and, they will, and, they sh and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Uh, neither Gentile nor Jew, one shepherd, uh, one flock, that is the church. And we are one in Christ. Uh, we are one in Christ with all who believe my faith. Finally, verse 29. Uh, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And we're going to look into more about what that means next week as, as we talk about, you know, the first week we talked about standing on grace. Last week and this week we talked about standing on, on faith. Next week we talk about standing on adoption. And the whole idea, we're going to study the whole idea of being adopted uh, as children of God, as, as heirs to the promise. Uh, but for now, know that by faith, you are children of God's promise. No condemnation, no guilt. You are God's children. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the book of Galatians. And while parts of it seem deep, it is, it is such a, an important lesson for us to understand. Um, we are not saved by anything that we do. We are just saved by trusting that Jesus did it all. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.